From reading philosophy, I came up with three principles as the guiding principles for a just city. Uh, the principles of equity, democracy, and diversity. Uh, these were derived from the works of a number of philosophers, uh, most uh, preeminently, I suppose, Don Rawls. Uh, my choice of the word equity rather than equality uh, is, in fact, based on Rawls' argument uh, that uh, a policy ought to distribute benefits uh, to people where the worst off become better off. Uh, so the worst off don't have to become equal to everybody else, but no policy should in fact make those who are most disadvantaged more disadvantaged. And it means that uh, we have to talk about the policy at the time it's being enacted to say, well, we have to make our city more competitive because sometime in the by and by, uh, the benefits will trickle down to those people who are worst off. Uh, doesn't justify making them worst off at the time. Uh, we have a lot of examples in the world of people whose homes were destroyed uh, in the name of the greater good and said, well, eventually they will benefit. Uh, but equity means that you do not, in fact, take advantage of those people who are weakest. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, uh, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously, something had to be done. And in 1956, a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. This addressed the pollution from factories and the smog soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it. It's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries, and although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains and planes than in the 1950s, and this is now the main source of air pollution around the world.
Alexis de Tocqueville, as we have noted, appears to have had some appeal to both ends of the political spectrum, left and right, or rather, both have found him to be useful for their purposes in certain circumstances. His rational acceptance of the new forces of democracy brought about by the American and French revolutions made him an icon of left-wing liberals. However, during the Cold War, that is, from the end of World War II until the collapse of communism, he was adopted by some leading thinkers on the right. So there are two sides to his political philosophy and the man himself that we need to look at. Now, I would suggest that de Tocqueville's biography is important here. You must always bear in mind, when reading him, that he was an aristocrat, and one whose family had suffered in the French Revolution. He wasn't your typical aristocrat, because his politics differed from others of his family and social rank. He abandoned the Catholic Church and married beneath his class. Yet he never quite threw off the prejudices of that class. However, and what is important, he did recognize and believe that the tendency of history, which in those days could be traced back to the Middle Ages, was towards the leveling of social ranks and more equal and democratic conditions. The French Revolution had in the end brought Napoleon, whom he hated, but democracy would inevitably come to France. His trip to America was to see democracy in practice, make note of its shortcomings and errors, and then find safeguards against them. Most of what the general public knows about daily life in ancient Rome comes from art, architecture, and literature, which tell us more about the elites, especially、um, the goings-on of the emperors. But how much do we know of the lives of ordinary Romans? Did they have a voice, apart, that is, from what we can gather from graffiti? The usual picture is one of time spent at festivals, baths, and typically the games. However, for many Romans, terrible living conditions, poverty. Debt and the chance of being sold into slavery at any moment—that is, if they weren't slaves already—left no time or energy for such forms of entertainment, or for any interest in politics, for that matter. Indeed, after the death of Augustus, executive power was taken from the elected assemblies of the Roman people. Now it was the emperor's job to look after the people, and his generosity often depended on the mood and behaviour of the people, on how often and how violently they protested and rioted. One example would be Claudius ensuring a steady grain supply even in winter after rioters pelted him with stale crusts of bread. There is an anecdote about 
um, Hadrian. While touring the provinces, an old lady approached him with a complaint. He made excuses and tried to get away. She said that if he wouldn't give her a hearing, he shouldn't be emperor. She got her hearing. There was a time when the subject of happiness was the business of philosophers, as part of their discussion of what makes for the good life. Then, much later, psychologists and sociologists got in on the act, and now it seems so is the government. I understand that governments should have the welfare and well-being of those it governs at heart, from the purely practical point of view of keeping people quiet at home, enjoying their gadgets and comfort, rather than on the streets rioting. But surely it's not something you can legislate for. Today there are numerous journals on the topic, and it is even included in the curriculum at some universities and colleges. Surveys are done, statistics compiled, graphs drawn. Yet all they seem to prove is what most people have concluded themselves from personal experience. An obvious example would be that having a lot of money doesn't necessarily make you happy. We all wish to be happy and have ideas about what it is we think would make us so, but we also know or suspect that it's not that easy. Most of us learn that it is a byproduct of something else, usually being totally absorbed or involved in some task or pastime, and can only be reached that way. These activities, of course, must be worthwhile in themselves.
As physicists tried to explain the masses of particles, they found that if they just tried to inject the mass into the mathematical equations in the most straightforward way, just put a parameter for the mass of a particle right into the math, the math didn't work. It gave rise to quantum mechanically inconsistent features. So it was recognized that you needed to have a more subtle way of introducing mass into the equations that would not spoil the fundamental symmetries but yet would allow the particles to have different masses. You see, fundamentally the idea is that all particles begin life as being massless. There's a high degree of symmetry associated with that. All of the particles have the same mass, zero. How do you inject mass without spoiling that symmetry which is vital for the equations to make sense? The Higgs field does that. By immersing everything in this bath, this molasses-like bath, it turns out that the equations allow you to have your cake and eat it. The fundamental symmetries are deeply preserved, and yet the way in which the particles move, experiencing different resistance-like drag force, allows them to have different masses. Conduct disorder in children is very serious. It's a disorder of childhood and adolescence that is long-term, that's chronic, where children have very aggressive impulses, where children are involved in difficulties with the law and really seem to have no disregard for the rules or for authority. When children have conduct disorder, they're definitely at risk of carrying these difficulties into adulthood, which also brings about a myriad of different problems. Children with conduct disorder often have difficulties in schools, have difficulty with relationships, and have difficulty with employment and lifelong, long-term relationships. It's important to recognize that if your child is not doing well in school, if your child has had difficulties where legal action was necessary, if your child is bullying, getting into fights, and this is constant and ongoing, if your child does not get help, these complexities will really exacerbate into other major difficulties. Look for signs of your child's grades dropping, look for signs of repeated detentions, suspensions, and brushes with the law. Parents, please recognize that if your child has signs of conduct disorder, the sooner you get help, the sooner your child can start to learn more adaptive behaviors.
So there are two theories for how the gas giants formed. One is the same theory I showed you just now, core accretion, right? And the other is called disk instability. And one of um, our colleagues at DTM um, has done a lot of work on that. And so it's unclear exactly how they formed, but you're right, what we're trying to do, the reason we're trying to get to higher and higher pressure in the lab is because we're trying to understand more about the pressure inside the gas giants. It's thought that the gas giants also have a metallic core, but maybe a metallic core not made of iron. Hydrogen, for example, becomes metallic at a certain pressure. Okay, so, so it's very possible that the insides of these planets um, could have metallic cores, could have hydrogen cores, could have uh, rocky portions. We're not sure, but the higher pressure we can get in the lab, the higher the pressure we can get in the lab, the closer we can get to understanding the interiors of the gas giants and the exoplanets that are so big. Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about setting up a website. I'm going to be focusing on things that you need to consider to ensure your website really adds value to the people using it. So, there are three main areas you need to think about. The first and most important thing is who is your target audience. When you're creating a new website, you really need to think about who the users are and what information they'll be looking for. What we do when we set up websites is to group users based on their needs. So, for a website in the academic community, for example, we may have groups such as researchers and administrators, and this helps us design the site and add information that is relevant to each group. The second point is accessibility. The main thing here is to ensure your website can be found. And you can do this by making sure it can be reached from areas on the web where your target audience are also active. So this may mean providing links on other websites or maybe using social media. And thirdly, retention. Making sure your target audience return to your website regularly. You do this by ensuring it gives them a reason to come back. So it's important to keep the site up to date and make sure it provides the latest news and interesting information and so on.
Supersymmetry is a mathematical idea that people have developed in effort to understand the sharpest organizing principle for the fundamental constituents of matter. You see, we have learned that particles that seem to be different can actually secretly be united by certain symmetry principles. So we're used to the fact that there are symmetric objects in the world like a, a sphere or a basketball. You turn a sphere and even though you've transformed it, it looks the same, fundamentally. We found that certain particles, when you transform one particle into another, even though it looks like the identity of the particle has changed, overall the equations describing it, they don't change at all, an underlying level of symmetry. But what we've not been able to do is find a symmetry that would relate certain kinds of particles, namely matter particles and force particles. Matter particles are particles like electrons and muons, quarks. Force particles are like photons and gluons and WZ bosons. Supersymmetry is a symmetry that actually relates these two kinds, these two classes of particles. And people have proven that supersymmetry is the last possible symmetry of the fundamental particles that our mathematics, reality, has not yet been shown to make use of. So people are now trying to see whether that symmetry might actually be at work in the world. Can we find evidence for it in our understanding of the fundamental particles?